This is the last webinar of this second series that we are organizing with parliamentarians for the Global Goals with the Sustainable Development Network and, of course, with the Universal Health Coverage 2030. So here we are going to have a very interesting program. This time we are making changes. We are going to, to start with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs for his opening remarks. Then we're going to have our panelists and then we are going to jump to uh, breakout sessions because we want to share the best practices that we're implementing at the national level. The national budgets are a key aspect on how to turn the into local realities. Uh, if I may, I would like to ask you to please turn, on, turn off your microphone because uh, if you don't, we're going to listen to your conversations. So uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, who is going to give us the opening remarks. Gabriella, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, also to uh, Kirsten Brosbell and all of my colleagues, uh, Lauren Bredo and others at SDSN. And thank you to uh, Amherst uh, students also for the interpretation services. Uh, this is a, a very important workshop uh, with a very basic idea. Uh, and that is that our budgeting should be based on our goals, uh, not our goals based on our budgeting, uh, or not the two separate. It, typically, budgets uh, facing parliaments are set a year at a time and in a very incremental manner. Uh, that uh, this year's budget looks like last year's budget with some adjustments depending on the annual priorities. If we operate in that way, we will not achieve our goals, especially broad transformative goals, such as the sustainable uh, development goals or the Paris Agreement for Climate Safety. The SDGs and the Paris goals are goals that are set for many years in the future a very bold transformations to arrive at a better future by the year 2030 or the year 2050. With the SDGs, we have a number of commitments that all of our countries have made to ensuring that every child is in school, that everybody has healthcare coverage, that everybody has modern energy services and we have set the year 2030 as the timeline to achieve those universal objectives. For the Paris Climate Agreement, we stated the goal in terms of limiting warming on the planet to under 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then the scientists translated that into a global need to decarbonize the energy system by mid-century. So in both the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, we have a, a set of objectives that require us to look forward for 10 years in the case of the SDGs and even 30 years in the case of the Paris Agreement. Now, I'm sure members of parliament will uh, recognize that this is not the normal way that the budget processes uh, are discussed. And the idea of linking budgets to goals, which is so basic and so crucial, is not how my government in the United States operates, not even close. Uh, and it's not how governments in most parts of the world operate but it is the purpose of our workshop today. I believe the parliamentarians should be demanding of government and asking of government ministers who come to parliament to present the budget, how does this budget relate to achieving the sustainable development goals? 
And in each of the critical areas, and these will be the topics of the breakout sessions, parliamentarians should press and find out and confirm that the budget that is being proposed is consistent systematically with achieving goals as of the year 2030 in the case of the sustainable development goals. And so this is the point of our workshop. If we could make our budget allocations consistent with our goals, we will actually achieve our goals. If we leave the budget and the goals as two separate uh, ideas or leave the goals as simply an inspiration or an aspiration, but treat the budget in practical terms as something divorced from the goals, we will fail to achieve the goals. Now, let me finally uh, add one basic point. For most low-income countries, the budget is not sufficient in and of itself to achieve the SDGs. If uh, a low-income country wants to ensure that every child completes a secondary education, which is SDG uh, 4, or that every person in the country has universal health coverage, which is SDG 3, or that every person has modern energy services, which is SDG 7, I think you'll find that the budget cannot sustain that level of investment needed to achieve those goals. And so then a problem opens up that is a problem of global cooperation not merely a problem of domestic budgeting. It should be the job of government and parliaments to identify the budgets that are needed to achieve the goals. And when there is a gap between the needs and the realities in terms of what is available, that is also the responsibility, not only of your own country, but of the entire international UN system to help you to close that financing gap. To close the gap might mean debt cancellation. It might mean debt restructuring. It might mean increased development financing from the Inter-American Development Bank or the African Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank or other kinds of development assistance. But we need to identify the financing gaps in order to mobilize the international cooperation needed to close those financing gaps. So let me end here by emphasizing the idea of today's workshop. We need to budget for successful achievement of the goals that we have set. Parliamentarians need to know and hear from government <laughs> that the budgets are aligned with success. Government and <coughs> parliaments together need to identify financing gaps that can be closed by domestic resource reallocation or when necessary by international support. But we need to get serious on putting the resources behind our objectives, on ensuring that we are mobilizing the financing needed for the investments for success. I'm very excited by today's workshop. Uh, Gabriella, let me turn it back over to you and thank all of the participants and look forward to an extremely important and lively and creative session together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And, and again, thank you all for participating in the webinar. Allow me to remind you that we are having interpretation services uh, from English to Spanish. Uh, así que para aquellos que hablan español pueden utilizar, por favor, los servicios de interpretación. And we are going to continue with our uh, webinar. Now we are going to uh, go to the overview, designing national budgets. Just as Professor Sachs was mentioning, 
we need to align our goals to the national budgets that we're designing, we're discussing, and finally we are approving as parliamentarians. Sometimes we don't know how much we can do in a parliament to change people's realities if we are able to build better budgets. So we are going to have three panelists. I would like to start with Dr. Ahmed Admandari. He's the regional director of the World Health Organization at the Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office. Uh, I had the pleasure to have a meeting with him just a couple of weeks ago in, in Cairo. And uh, allow me to tell you that we decided to invite Dr. Almandari because he's really making a difference working with parliamentarians directly. They are building a very interesting network. So he's a very good example on how we can translate global commitments to national realities. Thank you very much, Dr. Almandari. The floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriella, for your introduction. And thank you, uh, Prof. Jeffrey, for introducing the lines of this workshop. It is my great pleasure and honor to be with you. Uh, so um, I, I'm going to just share with you um, um, my presentation. Uh, so I hope the slides are uh, clear, visible yes. to you, colleague. Great. Um, um, I mean, just I'd like to start my uh, presentation with this slide in which, uh, you know, proudly saying that uh, our DG, Dr. Tedros, has signed in 2018, you know, the Memorandum, memorandum of Understanding uh, with the um, IBU. Uh, it is a very great, uh, you know, milestone and step towards working together and strengthening the collaboration between both of our organizations and ourselves as well to serve our countries and make sure, as Prof. Geoffrey have mentioned, that you know, whatever finances and funds given to different sectors in the country uh, are given also to the healthcare system uh, in a very sort of equitable manner that will serve citizens. You know, that sort of memorandum of understanding signed between the two organizations uh, based on um, the GBW 13 uh, strategic planning in which, as stated here, that WHO will leverage domestic investment uh, in health by fostering citizens' participation, civil society dialogue, and by interacting with governments, including heads of states and parliamentarians and finance minister. So parliamentarians play a very major role in that sort of, of discussion and implementation of whatever uh, suggestions or recommendations that we, we all uh, seek to. Based on that, Emo, we have started in 2018, in fact, a lot of activities. And I'm really happy to see colleagues from Emro participating in this workshop in order to make sure that we are not missing a very key player in these sort of discussions and rebuilding and supporting healthcare system who are, which are the parliamentarians. So in 2018, September, we started our expert advisory group consultation through, um, in, in a meeting in, in Amman, Jordan, uh, which was then uh, followed by, you know, in, in that meeting, in fact, there was um, a discussion and exchange of experiences and lessons from different countries uh, on um, how best you know, to promote the role of parliamentarians in supporting the healthcare system. Uh, that was then followed by another meeting held in the same year in Beirut, uh, planning the way forward and establishing what we call uh, regional uh, parliamentarian uh, forum or group, uh, which was then taken afterwards in, in, in another meeting the year after in Tunisia, and there was a plan to have another meeting in 2020, but we couldn't make it because of COVID-19. Uh, now, when we look at the role of parliamentarians in Imro here, we have uh, two main approaches, how to promote that sort of rule. The first one is through, through promoting parliamentarians' access to evidence to guide their decision for quality and affordable health services for all. And the second sort of approach is to promote policy dialogue between parliamentarians, governments, and other stakeholders within the same country, which then later on, all of these two things will lead to evidence-based decisions that is made you know, to address the priority health needs of all in the most effective, effective and efficient manner, leaving no one behind 
fulfilling the expectation of the GBW 13. Now, when, when, it, come, when it comes into uh, rules of parliamentarians, here in, in, in EMRU, we identified four main rules in promoting health and well being for all, as I said, based on the spirit of the GBW 13 and our vision, health for all by all. The first rule is lawmaking. Parliamentarians play a very major role when it comes into reviewing and proposing legislations that will definitely impact directly or indirectly the health and the health system. The second rule is through budgeting, reviewing and approving national budgets that are coming to their, their the, the, the body, parliamentarian bodies, before going up into uh, Minister of Finance for final implementation. The second, third rule is oversight, monitoring the executive branch and holding it accountable when it comes into the, you know, making use efficiently and effectively the resources we have. And the last rule is representation, which means representing the diverse interests and needs of their constituents and those who selected them and trusted them to do so. Now, when I'm you talk sorry. about- I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Our translator is act asking you to um, slow down just a little bit. Thank you, please continue. Sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry for that, you know, I just want to save time, sure. Thank you. So now when it comes into advancing the universal health coverage, which is considered as the heart of engaging parliamentarians here in the region, we in fact, you know, based on, on, on the meaning and the definition of the universal health coverage, that all people and communities can use the promotive or the different, I mean, the wide range of services from promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, as well as palliative services they need of sufficient quality and safety as well to be effective, while also ensuring that the use of these services does not expose them to financial hardship. And here, in fact, just I'd like to share with you three pillars, the population covering, which means that we have to make sure we cover everyone and no one is left behind. The second pillar or dimension is the service covering, which means that we will make sure whatever systems we have are really providing the services I have mentioned just that are preventative, curative, rehabilitative, and other services needed, and leaving no service that the community in need of it. And the fair, third and the most important pillar and dimension is financial protection. We need to cover large population, we need to cover large number of services, but at the same time, we should not expose by doing so the people in the community to financial hardship. So that is the spirit of what is the meaning of universal health coverage in IMRO. This is just to share with you uh, the level of the universal health coverage or service coverage in EMR based on reports 2015 and 2017, comparing the two. Overall, if you see here the EMR median, uh, we used to be uh, 60, five uh, approximately in 2015, but we moved into uh, 68 almost in 2018. Now that is the middle value of a wide range that, that is between 25% uh, in Somalia, for example, and reaching up to 83% uh, or 82% in Qatar. Uh, still, there is a lot of work needs to be done. Now, when, when it comes into the evidence, which shows us that the, the more public spending and government spending on health, the less the out of bucket uh, expenditure from individuals, which means financial protection. And in this graph, it shows that the more the spending countries are giving to the healthcare system in providing more services covering large population, the less the spending, the spending people are having on their own health, which means at the end, more, uh, you know, less exposure to financial hardship. Now, the key message is that I'd like to share with our parliamentarian colleagues are four. The first one, you know, based on our EMR financing atlas that was published in 2018, and based on its findings, key findings, you know, investment in health is insufficient, as have been mentioned by Prof. Jeffrey. Public spending on health is low, despite sufficient fiscal space that is available there. Population are not fully covered 
large number of people are left behind. They are not able to go and, and get the service they need and they deserve. This resulted in high out-of-bucket payment. So what will be the role of parliamentarians at, at this issue? My message, we need more public money for health. And here comes your role as parliamentarians, as I have mentioned in the four main rules that I just shared with you in the previous uh, slides. Now, the second message to you, you know, we all know that when it comes into the development of the budget and, and the spending to the healthcare system, it, it goes through three main stages. Uh, it, it will start by budget formulation, how the public spending you know, are, are, are given to the priorities uh, based on a determination. You know, and then it goes into budget, budget uh, execution, you know, using that money in a very efficient manner. And then again, it will go into uh, budget monitoring, how the public spending is accounted for uh, and results uh, of that are achieved. So it is like a cycle. Here comes the role of parliamentarians. In each of these steps, the role of parliamentarians is a key uh, factor. You know, uh, they need to be really effectively involved in each of these stages. And I know that some countries, parliamentarians are involved in each of the three stages in a very effective manner. But sometimes we need to fight for our right. Now, the third message here that we, we all do, classical input based budget do not necessarily align with health priorities. Many countries, they go based on the traditional way of developing the budget. They look at the money needed for personal number of staff in terms of quantity who, who are going to use goods and, and provide services. And then there is that transfer between them. But be, let me say that this is not going to really help us from now onward. We have to change our mentality when it comes into developing the budget. It has to be program oriented based on sector priorities for better service coverage, as I said, for better quality of service and for targeted support for vulnerable groups. So my third message, we need to move towards program based budgeting and we have to push for that. Otherwise there'll be a lot of uh, resources wasted, a lot of people left behind, which means introducing the uh, uh, public into uh, financial hardship. Um, my third, uh, I mean, last message, sorry for that. My fourth message, you know, that with COVID, we all have gone through almost a year and a half of lessons to learn. So WHO identified three measures to facilitate better budgeting for COVID response, in addition to the other services. The first one, you know, using existing budgetary flexibility to fund more public measures, which were lacking and not there be, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And we have all seen how much systems have, have been suffering, whether wealthy, well-resourced countries or low-resourced countries. Number two, accelerate revision of finance laws to secure a budget for the response through expenditure earmarking. This will definitely facilitate providing more resources to, to services that are in need, which comes on and off. It is not uh, continuous and it will, it will appear all of a sudden. The third one is the, the you know, release public funds to frontline service providers timely and facilitating expenditure tracking, which is very important to make sure that resources are really well utilized. So my message here, uh, we need to work with ministers, ministries of finance to ensure more and, and, and flexible money is given for health and health sector as well in general. So my, my concluding remarks, uh, colleagues, that you know, health for all, uh, by all uh, is, is our regional motto. It has been introduced in 2018 and endorsed by member states. Uh, we have made strategies, four strategies. We have um, managed to get some successes. We faced challenges, yes. Uh, that's why, in fact, we started this year, last month, uh, we call it midterm bush forward review for this vision to make sure that we are really heading towards our targets. We are in the right line and looking at lessons we have learned for the first half of this vision. The second uh, concluding remark, you know, parliamentarians can play important role, as I have mentioned with, to you, in promoting health, as well as well-being, and delivering, uh, you know, uh, on their multiple functions uh, and access to many government and non-government uh, decision makers and policy makers. 
COVID-19 highlighted the need to accelerate budget structure reforms. It is becoming a mandatory thing that we need to do based on the lessons we have learned for the last many years you know, and, and successes that we have gained or, or failures that we have uh, gone through, you know, towards more public money for health with flexibility and accountability. Uh, my last slide, just I'd like uh, to thank you, uh, Gabriel, and, and all colleagues for giving me this opportunity, uh, assuring you that we are very much committed to strengthen your rule, work with you hand in hand, and making sure that our target, all of our targets are really uh, fulfilled, you know, expectations are fulfilled. And here there are two just uh, links I'd like to share with you with uh, very wealthy resources of, of documents. The first one is about WHO program of work on budgeting in health. It has a lot of documents. If you go there, it is free, you know, free access. The second uh, link is on WHO repository uh, of health budget. You know, it, it also contains a lot of documents and wealthy resources of knowledge and evidence-based studies. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, and thank you very much, colleagues, for giving me this opportunity. Back to you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Almandari, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I think it's very clear how parliamentarians' responsibility can and must make a change to the budget, particularly when it comes to health. Uh, I would like to add that when we had this conversation in Cairo, uh, Dr. Almandari used, uh, I think, a very interesting concept, uh, at least from me. I am uh, from Mexico, from the other side of the planet. And it is the, the constant emergency where that some countries are experiencing. Yes, we are now in the middle of a pandemic that apparently has been in the middle like for a long time, but, but we're experiencing very challenging times during this COVID-19 pandemic. But we can also, and we should include in our budgets, those people that are living in constant emergencies immigrants, refugees, uh, internal displaced people. So there are a lot of things that we can do, but we we need also to take into account this, this very interesting concept, I think, and perhaps we should make a webinar or something on how we should be working for the, the people that are living in vulnerable circumstances or in these constant emergencies. Thank you very much, Dr. Almandari. Now we are moving to Dr. Fernando Aportela. Uh, I would like to, to mention that he is a, a professor at uh, ITAM, the Technological Autonomous Institute of Mexico, my own country and my alma mater, but he has a very interesting background. Dr. Aportela has been working in private businesses, in finance. He has been also a deputy minister, so he knows very well how the, the finance ministry uh, works and he's also in the academia. So when we are taking a look on how we should build more partnerships and work together with different stakeholders, well, he's a, a perfect example on how we can bring different voices to the table. Thank you very much, Dr. Aportela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gabriela, uh, for the invitation. Uh, do you hear me well? Okay. Yes. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation, um, being here in, and looking at the presentations of uh, this very important topic on, on how to incorporate SDG on, on all the national budgets. And it's always my impression that we have to somehow try to um, handle the budgets and to try to incorporate in the core of the budgets all the, all the SDG agenda. Let me share the presentation that I have um, which is a very brief presentation. I did this presentation with Regis Ruiz, who is also in the in the seminar. Do you do you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say that the budget is a living it's a living matter. Um, when you construct the budget, uh, basically what it does, it reflects it, the timing, the costs, and the nature of uh, doing and uh, getting the goals of the government and the agenda of the government. It is a financial, but it's also a political exercise that is, that is very important. It has the two things. And, uh, and as Professor Sachs mentioned, um, it has a lot of uh, already 
compromises and a, and a lot of uh, every year, most of the budget is already spent, which is a reality. You cannot change that over, over one day, over one year, over two years, five years. Uh, it's like a very big boat that you, when you steer the boat, it starts slowly, 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 because it has a lot of pre-commitments there. But one thing that is very important for parliamentarians is that there is a, a core principle for the budget, which is accountability. And that is an element in which you can have an influence and that you can have all the supervision and revisions that you need to have in order to try to incorporate over time the SDG goals. The question remains is how do you get the funds or the money over time to pay for the SDGs? Um, there are many agents involved in, in budgeting. Uh, the first one and the, probably the most important one which, because it is the institution that has the, as you say, as the lawyer said, that when you have the pen, you have some sort of advantage when constructing documents. Uh, uh, think on the Ministry of Finances of the institution that has the pen uh, writing the documents. Uh, the second one, of course, most very, very important is the parliaments and congresses. There are in some countries independent budget offices, which gives you the more of the long-term or multi-annual view of the budget in terms of uh, how are you forecasting uh, GDP growth or uh, population trends, et cetera, et cetera. NGOs and private advisors, of course, the referendums, no? Um, this is a, as I say, is a living exercise. But what you have to take into consideration is that when the budget is approved, that is just one picture. It's like uh, if you take a screenshot or with your cell phone, and that is the, the, the picture that you have at the very beginning of the fiscal year. But then over the year, the budget is a living thing and it changes. And probably that is where, where we have an opportunity here that we are going to describe later in the presentation. Um, it was mentioned briefly by, by my predecessors about the fiscal, the budgeting laws and fiscal responsibility laws. I will say that there, in the fiscal responsibility laws, not all the countries have them, which is a very, very good practice. And it's also a very good opportunity to, um, to introduce long-term or medium-term SDG goals. Um, one thing about the every year exercise of the budget, but if you have in the fiscal responsibility rules um, SDG goals and you incorporate SDG goals and as a responsible fiscal practice, which at the end of the day it is because it's not, uh, SDG are not fight with, are, are not fighting with uh, with responsibility over, over the long term, uh, because if you have health, if you have a good environment, at the end of the day, you also have um, fiscal sustainability. It's not only uh, health or, or global sustainability, it's also fiscal sustainability. You can introduce in those laws basic principles or basic guidelines of how much money you, can, you have to spend on SDG over time. So that is a place to look at it. Um, Certainly, not, not only budget, but also fiscal responsibility laws. Then um, you have to create, you can create committees. Uh, you can also, as a parliamentarian, check for uh, the budget every year. In some countries, it's checked every six years. It's the accountability, accountability principle that I mentioned. Um, but nevertheless, when you look at this, um, I will, I will say that one important piece that I want to mention that has not been mentioned a lot is that you have to consider how to introduce changes in the fiscal responsibility laws that are, that in some way they, they govern uh, every year budget exercise. So that is a good place to start. Uh, so when we talk about this, um, budget every year, um, at the end of the day is the discussion, where are we going to get the money to pay for the SDGs? No. Um, we can think of three things. Um, first, uh, 
to integrate basically to say, well, every year we have to spend in this area of SDG X amount of money, which probably will be difficult, especially in these circumstances where uh, we had uh, the pandemics and uh, all finances of all uh, uh, nations are stressed by the fact that they have to pay for the pandemic and they have a reduction. They also suffer a reduction in income in revenues, but um, it's something that you should try every year. Then you can also create a special committees uh, to or include an SDG agenda to existing committees. That's also the, that's something that is uh, a faculty, uh, a, a capability that parliamentarians have, and that those those two probably will be the as I mentioned, together with the changes in the fiscal responsibility laws, I think that those two will be like the traditional way of doing things over time. And the other one that uh, when Reyes and myself were thinking about this on, on, uh, on last, last week, uh, say, uh, why don't we propose something that is kind of a out of the box idea? And why don't we take advantage of the spending efficiencies of the executive? And that's the idea that we want to uh, we want to give to you. Uh, that's something that can be probably put together, and probably will be in all the countries. But something that uh, uh, certainly has, uh, I believe, given my experience in the government, uh, it's something that has some possibilities. Um, well. When you look at the budget, as I mentioned, the budget is a, is a screenshot uh, when you approve the budget. And then you start spending the money over the months, the next 12 months in the fiscal year. And what happens all the time is that you have some inefficiencies at the end of the day, because uh, you cannot spend all the money in all the projects that you have. The, for example, uh, one if you have an infrastructure project and then you have some rainings, some very strong rain at the end of the year, then you won't be able to spend all the money that you have allocated for that project. What happened with that money that it's, uh, it, it is not spent at the end of the year? Basically what the ministers of finance do, they, re they relocate the money and they tend to do, given the ministers of finances, they tend to relocate the money to improve the fiscal balance at the end of the year. It's not devoted to any other, uh, if the preference for the Minister of Finances is, um, is not to spend any new project, is to, to save it, uh, to improve the balance. As, uh, that, that's, that is how it is, that is how it's done. And they have the capabilities to relocate that. No? Um, so, Imagine that you say to them, to the ministers of finances in the discussion on, or you establish in the fiscal responsibility law and to say, well, you know, a percentage of those, of that money that you relocate every year at the end of the year, which is not money that uh, you have no, you have a use for that, uh, just a percentage of that, why don't we create a fund to finance the SDG agenda? And I don't think that that will be very difficult to promote or to pass with, um, with the ministers of finances. Why? Um, because at the, at the very beginning, when the screenshot is taken, um, everybody, is, everybody will say to you, I'm going to spend all the money. The reality is they are not. They will, they will always be surpluses at the end of the year. So in a, in a way, uh, you are allocating zero at the end of the project. But every year you will have money by the end of the year. So you can have an instrument to finance the agenda uh, that can be permanent, taking a percentage of these, uh, of these uh, uh, inefficiencies or surpluses that develop in the budget process, in the execution of the budget every, every year. So that's what I have to say. It's uh, um, we have a paper in the in the rest of the 
of the presentation, which is how the budget is done. It's an OECD paper, which is uh, I, we believe is, is a good paper. But that's uh, those are my comments. Um, it is important. It is always important to uh, to think about the budget as a living process. It's always important the supervision um, and we given the circumstances in which we are it is uh, also a good idea to start thinking on this type of uh, extra budgeting solution that can be funded over time without without uh, many resistances from from central governments thank you very much again gabriela for letting letting uh, let us uh, participate in this webinar thanks Thanks to you, Dr. Aportella. Thank you for your very good uh, advice and, and good remarks. I think that having this perspective from someone who uh, worked at the executive uh, in Mexico that had a strong relationship with the parliamentarians, now with the academia and private businesses, it's very interesting for us as, as members of parliament. Uh, we're having a couple of uh, questions for you at the group chats. Uh, so as we're going to jump to the breakout sessions, I am not sure if we're going to have time for answering the, the questions. So if you can please uh, give them the, the answer, that could be very useful. And now we are going to our third panelist, Dr. Elizabeth Hege, Research Fellow from the Sustainable Development Governance Program. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, you have now the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I work at the, I, I will try to share my screens. Do you see it now? And you hear me? Perfect. Um, so I work at IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, um, where we did a study that I'm, I was asked to present here very briefly uh, in 2018 already. Uh, which is called Integrating SDGs into National Budgetary Processes. And why did we do this study? Um, because we went to the high level political forum, which is the review forum for the SDG agenda. And we heard uh, more and more countries um, stating that they are, have aligned their budget with the SDGs. So we thought, well, that sounds interesting and actually quite concrete compared to what you sometimes hear at the high level political forum. Sometimes it's very general statement. So we thought, well, that sounds interesting, um, but what does it actually mean? So that was the main question of the study. Um, I also um, show here that as the, actually this SDSN network, um, one of the hosts here today also, also included in their report in 2019, the question to countries, do you make a link between the budget and the SDGs, yes or no? So, so there were actually 18 countries saying that yes, there is a link. So there are already first practices and we wanted to have a more um, qualitative approach to see, okay, what are actually the different methodologies that countries use um, to link the SDGs into the budgetary cycle and at what stage. So the last presentation uh, was very a very good um, um, introduction also to this because now um, you have the overview of, of all the cycle. And um, what we actually saw um, was, uh, for example, we had interviews with uh, representatives from Finland and Norway, and one way uh, they use the SDGs in their budgetary cycle is that they use it, as we could say, to, to improve their budgetary narrative. So they asked different ministries in their budget proposal to justify how uh, their budgetary proposal contrib contributes to the sustainable development agenda. And um, we thought this was in interesting and, and useful, but um, what I wanted to, to state, and I think my uh, the, the speaker just before me did this very well, is that these there are technical tools uh, that we can use to link the SDGs, to make reference to the SDGs, for example, in the budget as Finland and Norway do now. Um, but that is only one part. And then the other part is how do we use these technical tools in the political debate? And what I found interesting in Norway, for example, is that um, already before the SDG agenda, they have, have the tradition, tradition to include in the budgetary debate a session for also civil society actors to comment on the budget proposal. So we thought this was interesting. And we saw that now since the SDGs are part of the budget proposal, 
um, the CSOs, civil society um, organizations, could actually use um, these references, references to actually question the government and the ministries on their different proposals um, and whether they are really coherent with uh, the commitment they made to the SDGs. Here we have an example, for example, from development NGOs that uh, then realized that there was actually a decrease in, for example, the development assistance going towards energy, renewable energy deployment. And then they could use this uh, information and saying, well, you have committed to the sustainable development agenda. How is this compatible um, with, with these objectives? So um, this is one, one way we observed. And then there is another way. Um, some countries actually used um, the SDGs to organize like a mapping of their budget against the 17 SDGs. Um, here, maybe I want to state uh, two points is that, again, the question is that it's interesting to have this kind of overview. But then the question is, um, the more important question for me would be then how will this information be used in the budgetary debate or also to prepare maybe the next budget. But if we see that there, there's an incoherence maybe between what is uh, actually the, what are the political commitments. We say, for example, we have a strong commitment on, on climate and then we see there's there's almost uh, one, uh, no expenditure on climate. So how, what, how does this uh, work together? So this is one point. Then another point is that this is, of, of course, very broad to just link it to the SDGs. And the question behind this, uh, actually, so it's very difficult to see if we have uh, so, so much expenditure on, for example, agriculture SDG 2, that does not necessarily mean that this spending on agriculture is is compatible with the 2030 agenda because what is very important um, to to to, for, to me as a researcher is that the SDG agenda is about 17 sustainable development goals, but also about principles, and one of these principles being the coherence between the different goals. So if we have, for example, expenditure on agriculture, uh, which is uh, using, for example, a lot of pesticides and and uh, and uh, sub giving subsidies to, to practices that are uh, destroying nature or that are uh, supporting um, big, uh, um, big firms versus small firms, then we can question whether this is really compatible with the, with the spirit of the 2030 agenda. Um, then we saw another way countries use the SDGs in, in their budget, and that was at the moment of the budget evaluation. So we saw Finland again, for example, uh, what they did is that they um, evaluated some of their um, taxes and subsidies and the impact they have on a set of environmental SDGs. So that was limited to the environmental part. And um, then in Mexico and Slovenia, in our interviews, they told us that they thought actually that the SDGs were useful in updating their uh, budget performance indicator framework. Um, here is just to say that uh, what came out of our interviews was that many country representatives told us that it as budgets are a lot about priorities and difficult choices. It's important to translate the SDGs into the budgetary process to have a process of prioritization in the country. So that there's already at the beginning a debate on, on how can we translate the 2030 agenda into national priorities transform these into a national strategy with indicators. And then this can feed into, for example, an investment plan, as we have seen, for example, in Slovakia and, and also in, into, the, into the budget evaluation framework, for example, with indicators then that are adapted to the national context. So this was one important um, factor of success that uh, the country representatives uh, told us. And um, I just wanted to highlight also that the SDGs or the 2030 agenda are not the only way to, um, let's say, prove the budget with the sustainable development. I just wanted to highlight the example of New Zealand, um, which you might be familiar with, uh, that um, chose a well-being framework for their budget um, with um, five priorities. And so ministries have to, have to show how their budget proposal contributes to at least one of these objectives. And what I found most interesting, and I'm not an expert of, of this example, but I, what I found interesting in the, in the small articles that I read is that 
um, they also ask agencies and ministries to collaborate on budget proposals. And I think that is very important because, again, as, as I said, SDGs are not just about 17 goals, but also about the coherence between the goals. And so um, the question of how coherent is a national budget in itself. Um, so I find it very interesting that here we have, a, a, they ask these ministries to come together and work together on proposals so that they can really contribute to the, to the well-being objective of, of the country um, instead of just fighting against each other. Because of course, budget, uh, the making of budget is also about sometimes about fighting about uh, how much uh, uh, who gets what and so on. So I found that very interesting. Another example that we can mention is uh, green budgeting, which is, which is also um, a framework. There is the Purus uh, Collaborative on Green Budgeting uh, used by the OECD, uh, coordinated by the OECD, which was launched uh, by Mexico and France at the One Planet Summit, I think two years ago. And um, so they develop and share between countries, countries also different methodologies I, I'm, I found it a bit sad that it's only about the environmental part, but at least you have a lot of resources here on concrete uh, methodologies. And France is, for example, following this path. And um, what I just wanted to highlight here again is that, the, that thanks to um, these new me methodologies that France introduced on, on um, evaluating how, what, what is green and what is not green in their budget, um, this could this could be taken up by civil society actors again, or by think tanks, also by parliamentarians. So um, to then see, okay, now that we have the information, that this information is more readable, we can also, for example, make charts that we have here that was done by a think tank to communicate also to the population, okay, how much is actually um, green, how much of our budget is actually green, climate damaging, climate friendly, as they have shown here. And then this was taken up by the press. So again, what, what I like about this example is that it's did, that did not only stay at the technical tool that was developed, but then it's very important. And that's, that's really the role you can play as parliamentarians is that you use these technical tools that are sometimes very difficult to read for the, for the, for the citizens um, to then communicate it and, and, and question the government, uh, take on board the press if there are really incoherences that, yeah, that, you, that, you, that you find. So um, in conclusion, what we saw when we interviewed these, uh, the, the, these few countries is that there are very different methodologies from one country to another. And some of them are interesting to actually evaluate the, bu the, the, the budget's impact on sustainable development goals. Sometimes, but this is, was not very often that we found that but it could even be an opportunity to prioritize or identify in investment needs. But sometimes it only stays at the level of like a, a new technical tool that is maybe not easily used. And, um, and also the success factors that were cited by the country representatives were again, uh, the importance of having national priorities and then having this, uh, these tools actually creating a national debate. And maybe I can close with a, an example from, from Germany with a country that does not necessarily um, integrate the SDGs into their budgetary framework uh, in a, in a, in a, um, for the moment, but there was actually their, um, the court of auditors that did a report on uh, SDGs in, in, in Germany and they said, for example, it could be used in a way to actually discuss um, po public policies and um, associated expenditures. And they took the example of, for example, a prime that was paid out, paid out to families to, to build a home. So I was sub subsidizing the, the construction of, of new homes. And um, so they said, well, there is a, there's actually a need for new homes for families in Germany. But then the question is, uh, maybe we should not just pay out this prime to, to everyone uh, in every region, because this can have a very high environmental impact. But maybe we should see prioritize the areas where there are really a high need also for people that maybe do not have a lot of um, financial means to, to, to do it by their own and, and do not generalize the subsidy to everyone in every region, because then maybe there will be constructions that would not have been necessary so it can be a way, again, to coherently think about a public policy um, to see what are the impacts
on the environmental side, social side, um, and so on. So um, this was a brief overview of the study. You can, of course, have a look at Idri's website for more information or also contact me directly if you're free. Um, and if there are any other questions, I think we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm here also uh, via mail if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hege. I think this was an amazing opportunity to understand different policies and methodologies used to link SDGs to the national budgets. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experience. You have been working in different countries. So this uh, different kind of perspectives and, and uh, policies and mechanisms for budgeting are very useful for, for us as parliamentarians. Thank you very much.